Fedler from, um, from the Museum of Cultural History, University of Oslo, and now we get to learn a little bit more about the tapestries of Orsaberry and the new research that has actually just come out. So, bye. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll go deeper into some of the questions that Eva was raising earlier uh, about the use and function of tapestries in general, but uh, I will uh, uh, take a starting point uh, from the tapestries from Osweil. And uh, as Eva mentioned, tapestries used as wall hangings has a long tradition in Europe. Uh, and the best known example is uh, the Bayeux tapestry uh, from 1066, telling the uh, story of the Battle of Hastings in uh, 1066. But in Scandinavia, there are preserved fragments of wall hangings dating back to the 9th century. And um, their figurative motives probably represent myths and collective histories well known in the Viking Age. And I'm going to raise, first of all, some questions uh, about how they were used as part of house interior and for what purpose. Uh, the Osbeir mound was uh, excavated in 1904 um, and dated to the early 9th century. This, is, this grave is from uh, Westfall in uh, Norway, eastern Norway. Uh, and, uh, and of course, apart from the large Osebad ship and all the other equipment, there were also about 80 fragments of tapestries. Um, um, they have all figurative motives. Uh, and. Um, I would suggest that there are obvious reasons for considering both the Boyer tapestry and the Utsubai tapestries as part of a long tradition of creating textile imagery with a, with a significant narrative role. Uh, and uh, the tapestries from Utsubai uh, depict a myriad of finely shaped animals, humans, carriages and houses. And many of the motives have references to violence. And we can see battle scenes, Warriors in animal form and hanged men. Uh, that's just some examples. And part of the symbolism of these images can be linked to the warrior ideology and the myths surrounding it during the Viking era. And I'm going to argue that they might have had a function as rhetoric tools in the game of power, telling the story as the owner wanted it to be told. And their imagery could have been used to link or associate the owner with central myths in the Scandinavian society. Um, the visual narratives of the tapestries are preserved as fragments, and they are quite narrow, and the original height of the wall hangings was only 16 to 23 centimeters high, with four to five centimeters high figures. And they are created using a free tapestry weave, allowing for freely composing the figures and shapes in the tapestry with endless uh, pattern variation. And both differences in motives, language of form and size suggest that several different artworks were placed in the grave. And actually we have some new carbon datings uh, that uh, is not published yet. Uh, suggesting that uh, there are at least three different artworks here, uh, and they have been made with, with a, in within a, a large time frame. Um, and the height of the tapestries uh, is interesting. Um, we actually see that the height increase during the Middle Ages. Um, and um, uh, it, one could, su could should suggest that with less fine yarn, the same motifs could have probably been produced in larger scale without using more time during production. I don't know what to say to that, Eva, but, but uh, that could be the case. Um, 
And the tapestries, if they were larger, uh, they could also be more functional as isolation. So why do this, uh, these tapestries increase in height during the Middle Ages? And I think this is an important question to have in mind when discussing the possible change of use and function uh, of the tapestries during the Viking Age and Middle Ages. The tapestries from Ulfsbad depict different legends or histories, uh, and I will just briefly show you uh, a few of them. Uh, and this is uh, a new reconstruction of the lo two largest fragments. Um, uh, and they are very well preserved, uh, but it's difficult to see uh, and interpret when, when, when looking at them on the picture. That's why I, I'm using this reconstruction here. Um, and the central element in this scene is two covered carriages drawn by large horses. Male and female figures walk between the carriages, many of them carrying spears or other objects. And the scene could be illustrating an actual event, for example a funeral, but even more likely it could be illustrating a myth or an idealized ritual procession. And this fragment here is uh, older than the grave. I can say so much, but um, we are not. Um, we haven't concluded yet how much older. Um, symbols of violence are frequently used in the narratives, and two large tapestry fragments, in particular, clearly depict battle scenes. And the mythical features in the depicted scenes give us reason to assume that these are renderings of idealized or mythical battles. They are built up around a single scene, and in this one here, uh, two warriors in bear skin lead a band of warriors towards the left. Um, and they are met by a horned figure with two crossed sticks uh, in his hands. And of course, in uh, Norse mythology and poetry, warriors in bear form are asso often associated with the berserkers. And these warriors of Odin don bear skin, ferociously bit their shields, and charged the enemy, howling. And the bear's characteristics were tra transferred to the warrior so that he, in a sense, became a strong and dangerous animal. Uh, and here is another uh, interesting feature. Um, some symbols appear in several, several different forms and in many of the tapestry fragments, and spears are among them. Um, they, spears play a prominent part in these images, and they are recurring filling elements between the figures in many other fragments, um, and sometimes they appear together with birds, as in, in this fragment here that I showed you, you can see birds and spears or, um, or um, uh, arrowheads up there and down here and they are all, always pointing upwards and uh, the, the birds are also pointing upwards. So I don't know what this means but uh, they are used frequently as um, uh, filling in figures in these tapestries. Um, but also this shape here is very interesting because um, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, maybe a house construction. You see this oval um, shape here. Um, it, these vaulted formations that could be cross-sections uh, illustrations of house, houses with rows of spears on the roofs. I don't know if you can see it, but on top there are lots of spears uh, pointing upwards here. Um, and the shape uh, is covered with spears uh, molded very close together, pointing upwards. And spears are also associated with the dwellings of gods in Norse mythology, and especially with the halls of Odin. 
Valhalla is described, described in the sayings of Grimnir in the Poetic Edda. Uh, the halls of Odin, where the roof is made of spears and the walls are covered with shields. Uh, and spears have also been found ritually deposited uh, in Scandinavian grave mounds, uh, as well as in houses in the military area uh, in Bitka. And this um, image must have held some particularly significant uh, meaning because the motives is recurring in later medieval tapestries as well. For example, this one here from Rennebu in uh, Norway, dating to the 12th century. Um, here, the many rod-like elements mounted on the roof are adorned with crosses instead of spears. Uh, nonetheless, the motive is easily recognizable, as you can see. And perhaps the trans transition from spare points to crosses is indeed a sign that we are dealing with an idiom uh, where the meaning is subject to change. If this house in pre-Christian time was a way of representing a hall, a Norse place of worship, the same imagery could, reason, uh, it could easily be converted into a uh, sacred place of worship in a Christian context. Um, so whether, um, whether you uh, see them as representations of myths, rituals or actual events, it should, uh, should be reasonable to assume that many of these scenes depict the tapestry fragments uh, that are images of well-known concepts. As Scandinavian society did not have a proper written culture in the Viking Age, oral narration of poems and stories served as an important part of society's shared memory. And several poems exist written down during the Middle Ages which describe the significance of tapestries when it comes to preserving and passing on collective narratives. Uh, and the poems uh, from uh, the Poetic Edda may be the closest thing we have to a source for all Norse myths. But however, as uh, you all know, uh, they were put in writing almost four centuries after those of their burial and have been reshaped to some extent by Christian ideals. But they nonetheless present valuable uh, representation of traditional religious beliefs and worldviews in the Viking Age and are probably rooted in much older oral storytelling traditions. So how uh, were these tapestries originally used? Uh, the tapestries from Ulsebeir uh, were found inside a grey mound and inside um, uh, uh, um, the grave chamber. And some of them were laying on display, uh, but some of them were stored away in the chest. But uh, how were they used before that? Because we know that some of these tapestries are, as I said, much older than the grave. Uh, in the High Middle Ages, tapestries was were used as wall hangings in the hall and near the high seat, if we uh, are to believe the written sources. Traditionally, in Norway, modern, uh, early modern Norway, they were placed in eyesight over the benches. But they were not, as Eva said, hanging on display, display all the time. There is a long tradition in Scandinavia for using wall hangings as decoration on special occasions only. The house was decorated with precious tapestries or other wall hangings when a feast was coming up, or if a special and honored guest was expected. And their role as decorative objects and display of wealth is obvious, but they probably also had a function of setting the scene. The narratives on display would somehow be associated with the property owner giving the feast. And this type of occasional display offers a theatrical effect. Like the medieval triptychs, which was open on special occasions to make an entrance. Uh, as I said, the tapestries are narrow 
You need to get quite close to them to read the narratives. Why make such an effort to produce narratives that is not visible unless you are very, very close? Some of the medieval sagas might offer a reasonable explanation for this. Uh, the saga of Olaf Haraldsson describes how tapestry depicting the famous history of Sigurd the dragon slayer was placed behind the king sitting in the high seat in a great hall. Thorfinn's skull sat on the bench in front of King Olaf, and then the king said to him, tell us, skull, about the story depicted on the tapestry. And this story offers a possible explanation why the tapestries were made so narrow and small. A key word here could be restricted access. The sagas should ha uh, show how authorized an authorized interpreter, namely the skull, should explain the narrative. Thorfinn was asked by the king to explain the narrative depicted on the tapestry, and he was invited to sit by the king near enough to see what was on display. The interaction between the tapestry weaver, the skull, and the occasion is essential here, I think. The tapestry weaver is the one depicting the narrative, and thereby choosing the way a collective history is presented. But the restricted access to the tapestry on display also offers an opportunity to control how the narrative is interpreted. The skull chosen by the king is the one explaining the narrative to the people sitting in the hall. In a more ordinary farm context, it should be the local storyteller, maybe, uh, um, that interprets the narrative on the, uh, on the wall hangings. And seen this way, the tapestry works as a memory stick. And to understand these tapestries, we need to try to understand more about the interaction between the weaver, the tapestry, and the poet. And maybe central myths in Norse mythology, as we see them in the medieval written sources, originates in this tradition, as displayed on tapestries such as the Usubai tapestries. The occasional use and the placement of these tapestries in the room might be of importance when interpreting early medieval buildings as well. Thank you.